trying to mitigate against it, so we are done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you did, the more you learn about it, the more you realize how terrible it is. That's why people are. I said, if I really want to torture myself, I, I'd be an oceanographer. So you get. I think we can. I or you could just torture everyone else and make them feel like their life is pointless. That's the point. See, I'm a door-to-door existent. I can tell. So I, I, I can tell. I encourage you, you. You encourage. So this point is you. You uh, by only by realizing and accepting the futility of such things can one realize one's In your opinion, that's your opinion. This is the only way to realize one's own full potentiality. I don't think you're with the majority of science on that facility. Oh. The Earth is trying to change. We can mitigate if we want. Well, the thing is that Trudeau has been through many horrific uh, uh, mass extinction events. It comes back by only after building uh, tens or hundreds of buildings. Yeah, so that's never been through one of these events. Well, it has. The worst was the Permian. So we've been through one that was caused by the species on Earth. Exactly. And that's what they, so we should be proud of that. They call it the Anthropocene. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the new geological theory of they call it the Anthropocene. It's incredibly, it's been incredibly brief since it started, but it's been in the most of the world, despite how briefly we've been industrial and active, it's been one of the most dramatic periods in the entire world of history, the Anthropocene. Because of our reckless destruction of this Right. Whereas if we would have started mitigation years ago. I know everybody's still getting some new stuff in. I'll get the full media permit for that. I'm taking out a few bottles so we can get there as much as possible. Um, today I want to make my first announcement. We have all of these plastic plates in here. Don't throw those away. Whenever you're done with them, we're going to wash them and reuse them every week. So whenever you're finished, if you just want to stack them on either one of those tables, we'll pick it up at the end of the meeting and they'll be fresh and ready to use next week. Uh, second on uh, the list for today, we have a meeting today, this afternoon, and also sometime this weekend to keep progress on the tiny home. We're making our way. Uh, we have the walls up now. We have all four walls, and we have a door on its way. And, um, <laughs> We're continuing to work on the insulation, the, the packed bottles. So for anybody who has a kitchen full of plastic bags, Walmart bags, because I know everybody just throws them into their kitchen cabinets, if you want to take those in next week, we are more than happy to take those off your hands and use them. We use them for our tiny home. Yes, Dr. Yes. <laughs> um, why don't we challenge everyone to bring a dozen bottles or a, a, a plastic bag full of bottles to keep I can do that. I'll make this challenge. <laughs> Bring in a plastic bag full of empty, clean uh, plastic bottles to each Friday meeting. If everyone does that, we'll at least have more than we have now. Yeah, only if you already have them lying around. Them. You, you don't want you going them. out buying bottles. Just take it. Just go to a dumpster diving in the recycle. Just go to a dumpster dive. Take it from friends that they're already bought, but we don't want you to go out and buy a six pack of soda and. And just go to a, a beach or some place. A beach has uh, tons of refuse that washes up from the uh, sick. If from the, uh, to a beach between now and next Friday, that would be cool. uh, If need be, you'll find yeah. trash everywhere. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you if you guys can take us, bring us uh, all your trash, we'd be more than happy to take it. I'm gonna have Josh Crosby speak to us today. He has some information for uh, for us on. And then after he's done, we're going to turn it over to Mayor to Mayor Battle to tell us about uh, Huntsville's progress on sustainability. So hope you all learned something today. Hey guys, I'm Josh Crosby. I uh, just want to be really brief. I work out at Amardek Energy Labs. So we're doing tons of energy projects. Uh, looking for interns for the summer. Uh, LDs, MEs, aerospace, chemical, whatever. So we've got two different companies that are supporting the lab. Uh, one is I2T, one is Centel. We're both hiring. Uh, we, we're doing anything from designing things like these solar leaves to working with lightweight solar for the military that's lightweight.
great ballistic building large systems to launch big heavy things. So if anybody's interested, y'all can see me afterwards and give you a card. And Several city groups, Energy Huntsville, uh, Cyber Huntsville, Geo Huntsville, to help uh, grow those elements of this town that, that we have a lot of talent in that can be used in more than just government contracting. And uh, I'm just a really good guy. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce the mayor. Would be to heat up a big old vessel 
it turned it into steam. We would send the steam out to the arsenal. Amarnak used the steam. The whole arsenal used the steam. And the arsenal bought the steam from us uh, so that we could use it for energy. Now, uh, we were sustainability because we wanted to save the environment. We did not want to open another uh, another trash pit, another uh, fuel, uh, another cell. Uh, we did not want to have a dump. Because how many of you have ever tried to site a dump? <laughs> I have. Anybody who wants to decide, I want this dump in this place, you have a whole bunch of people who will come out and say, not in my backyard, and you don't want to ever have to site a dump. That is something that you don't ever want to have to go through. So we found if we burned our garbage, if we turned it 10 tons of garbage and 3 tons of ash, we could build up, and if you've seen our, our mountain that we've made uh, down uh, off of Johnson Road and Lehman Ferry area, we have built our own mountain, but we've made it out of uh, being sustainable, out of burning garbage, turning it into energy and making it into another form of energy. And that's one of the things that people don't realize. When we started doing this back in 1988, technology back then, uh, and it's something that really uh, a lot of communities could have taken advantage of, and if they had a good neighbor who was going to use energy, they would be able to find a way to do it. So sustainability has, has about three different factors to it. The economics of it, uh, and when we start talking about economics, <coughs> energy hustle. We solve problems by monitoring, generating, and, uh, and the conservation of energy. Geo Huntsville. Geo Huntsville ties right into the energy Huntsville because every time that you start looking at how am I going to save energy, you look at a map and you look at a map that shows the grids and how am I going to, where's my energy usage? And I've spotted energy usage here, energy usage here, energy usage here. How do I get those to interplay? How do I make sure, how do I save energy when I get on my highways by keeping people from being stopped less, uh, less in traffic queues, less in traffic lines? Uh, burn less energy as they, as they go or use lighter cars. We do it through a geospatial platform. And so you have to have geospatial and geo hustle ties right into energy hustle. Cyber hustle. Uh, you know, when you get down to it, every one of our grids is run by, by some type of computer system. And every one of those grids run by a computer system has a vulnerability. And that vulnerability is our cyber vulnerability. Cyber hustle ties right back into that energy side too because it protects that energy side. One of the biggest threats that we have is somebody attacking our grid. Uh, how many of you were here when we had our tornadoes of uh, 2009? Do you, do you remember what happened when those tornadoes came through? I mean, it was a perfect storm for a cyber attack. When they first came through, they wiped out uh, all of your power. Your power went out. Then your fin financials went out, so you couldn't use a credit card, so your financial system went out. Uh, then your batteries went out on your uh, that were on your cell towers, and your cell towers went out, so your comm lines went out. And all of a sudden, we were sitting there, and we we're back in the Stone Age. And we we're sitting there, we we're looking at a beautiful sky, which is a beautiful sky, lots of stars and everything else. But we were back to the Stone Age. We were starting over again. And uh, when, when TVA came to us and said, we're going to be like this for two weeks, we said, no, no, wait, guys. We've got to get back into operation a little bit faster. And we saw the vulnerability that we had. And all of that vulnerability that we had, We've run several tabletop exercises to make sure that we don't are not as vulnerable next time as we will this time. So, advanced manufacturing. You know, we've had some really good luck on advanced manufacturing. Remington, uh, Polaris, GE Aviation, uh, Toyota, all advanced manufacturing. Every one of those guys were looking, how can I be more sustainable? How can I be more energy compliant? The Toyota plant today is at zero energy. It's a zero energy plant. What they bring in, they burn. What they send out, they, uh, uh, they, they send out uh, a zero emission. And that is one of the things that you're looking for in the community. You want companies that are going to be partners like that. We will partner with you to make a better community. Hudson Alpha, the genomics of the future. Who would ever think that you'd have a battery that would work off sucrose, fructose, and glucose? And now, just off the sugar sides of it, you can run a battery and you can make energy out of that. That is, that's some of the cutting technology that you're finding coming just you know, less than a mile from here when you go to the Hudson Alpha. And then startups. You look all around at all the startups that we have here and all the innovation we have here, all the entrepreneurship that we have here, everybody is working on how to make a better mousetrap, how to make something more energy efficient, how to make something lighter uh, so that it uses less energy, how to make a better, uh, how to make a, the person who is going to make the billions and billions of dollars uh, uh, the, the next billionaire is going to be the person who figures out how to make batteries, batteries that will store up uh, all day and then run out the energy 
So, social. How do we educate our workforce for the jobs of tomorrow and help existing workers remain relevant in today's changing world? You know, that's something that we look at and it's something that we, as you work through, look at the workforce and many of y'all are going to that workforce. So, how do you make sure that you have jobs relevant? And how do you make sure in your relevant job that you keep your job relevant? That you keep making sure that you're making the right decisions? And that comes from education. That comes from workforce development. That is something that affects each one of us. How do we help our many nonprofits build capacity to deliver excellent services in efficient ways? Now, one of the things we don't get on about is our nonprofits. When you look at all the nonprofits we have out there that are working, how do we make sure that they're efficient and energy efficient and they're sustainable and that they're doing all the sustainable practices? That's something very hard. Uh, you look at us. We start talking about bringing in uh, uh, several bags of uh, plastic bottles. If you wanted to go down to Big Spring Park every weekend, after every weekend, and look at those garbage cans, you would have thousands and thousands of plastic bottles. We put out, uh, we put out uh, uh, recyclable cans out there, but still, if you look at the trash cans, you're going to find recyclable bottles. I mean, it's very easy to recycle those things. How do we as a community make sure that people recycle? Right now, most people don't realize that we pay $3 million a year to recycle uh, the plastics and the papers that we have. And we have uh, one of our vendors does that and goes around house to house, picks up the little blue bin, puts the little blue bin down, you take it back in the house and fill it up again, take it out, and on the buses every Thursday. But you know, we have about 30% of our people using that service. Only 30%. So we said, how can we do that better? So we started looking at it. And several people have tried to uh, start doing doing actually their recycling on their uh, floor. As they come in and bring in your garbage and you dump it on the floor so it's going to go into the burner, you would recycle out of there. You would take out your metals, you would take out your plastics, you would take out your papers and then send the rest of your garbage into the burning station to be burned. And, and we've tried to do that. We've not come up with an efficient way to do that because the energy we're using to, uh, to separate that out is, is uh, cost us more than the energy saving out of it. So we still have a ways to go in that. And then how do we make sure as a community make sure that those who have, have the is low income do less on sustainability than any other uh, any other segment. They're more densely packed together. Uh, their their garbage if you pick it up, you will notice there's not as many blue side recyclable bins out there. How do we make sure that we and can transfer our environmental and social conscious over to people who day-to-day, uh, -day, their day-to-day -day life didn't worry about the plastic bottle that goes in. Their day-to-day -day life was worried about putting food on the table, putting a uh, roof over their head. And that's something that we have to work on on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's an education factor that comes in. So the environmental has a lot of question marks. And I will tell you real, real uh, bluntly, those question marks don't have quick answers. Uh, it's interesting, we have our first uh, millennial on city council, 27-year-old young guy, Devin Keith, is uh, our councilman, and he's our first millennial. And we'll say, Devin, we're, we're, we're working through a problem like this. We've been working on it for five years. We're working through a problem like this. And he'll get his phone real quick, he'll Google it, and he'll come up and say, well, here's the answer. It says, do this, do this, do this. And, and we're in the Google generation. You look it up, and all of a sudden, well, this is what Google says, so that's the answer. And we said, well, we've tried some of that. We've tried some of this, that, and the other. There are a lot of hard questions out there that don't have the quick Google answers. And there's a lot of gray area out there on how you fix things. It's not just black, it's not just white. It's got gray area in the middle. And how, you know, how you make sure that if you're going to recycle, that, you, that the energy that you use recycle isn't more than the energy that you're going to save as you recycle. So those are some of the questions that we look at when we start looking at city sustainability and where we are with city sustainability is are we sure that we're getting our dollars worth out of this? City sustainability, if you look at all this, these are different ways that we work on city sustainability. Let me just walk you through it. Uh, LED light conversion. We've been doing that over a number of years. We've slowly but surely done our buildings. Now we're, we're looking at the possibility of what is it going to do if we take our, if, we, uh, if you notice, some of our streets we now have LED lighting on. If you go down Washington Street, 
uh, where we've just done with you. Washington Street skate plan, we put LED lighting up. And if you look at Washington Street and compare it to maybe uh, Jefferson Street, you're going to say Washington Street is much brighter. It's using a lot less energy, it's much brighter, um, and it really makes a lot of sense to go with the LED lighting in that. Um, brighter it is, the safer it is. But if, if you do that, uh, it's about $100 a fixture to go in, or maybe $150 fixture. By the time you get to put in, you've got about $250 a fixture by the cost of your labor cost. So, so how do you make sure that you, you balance off the cost of going to LED lighting with the cost with the benefits that come out of it? So that's a, that's a portion of the question we have, smart traffic systems. Nobody realizes how much smart traffic systems help. If you're standing the bus time queued up, if you're using uh, if, 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 if in line or queued up and turn lanes and everything else, you're using less energy, so you're being much more uh, sustainable in, in your efforts to put out less pollution too. And you use less gas and your gas bills less. So those are some of the things we try to do with smart, uh, smart traffic systems. A greenway plan. If you walk, it's much more energy efficient than if you ride and use, uh, use, use some of this, uh, this gasoline power, or even electric power. Wasting energy plant we talked about, the big picture of green, green pink bottle cap collection. Nobody realizes, but we challenge every school uh, in Madison County to bring in bottle caps. Whoever brings in the most bottle caps, they win money, they get to take it back, put it in their school PTA, and, and invest it back in the school. But what do we use the green bottle caps for? We take those green bottle caps, we send them out to Torrey, Alabama, and KLW, who is uh, the producer down there, melts them down and makes them into paint cans. And what is a stable way to take care of those bottle caps? Because what you do with a bottle cap is not going to go through your plastic recycling program. You have to send it somewhere special. So we save them. And we've been doing that through Operation Green Team for the past uh, 10 years in the city of Huntsville. Green Power USA, how do we make, produce, run an uh, electric car, and how do we engineer it, and how do we do it where it uses the least power and the light as possible and it's the fastest possible because it's in a competition. Through the Huntsville City Schools, we're doing that right now, the Green Park competition. Uh, feeding programs. Now, a lot of people don't, don't realize, but the feeding programs that come from the food bank, a lot of them are using uh, the, the garden table or the farm to table plan, where we end up using local farmers where we're not shipping things in from as far away, but we're shipping things in locally. And that's something that the city of Huntsville has been doing with the food bank for a number of years. A uh, revolving loan program, we, we put in some uh, some of the things that we look at now are food deserts. Uh, when you have places where you don't have uh, a store there that you can buy, and most of the people in there are not, uh, uh, are usually low income, they don't have cars, uh, they don't have a way to get around, they need a place locally that they can uh, come in and buy. Uh, buy, uh, buy just the basics of life, buy groceries and things like that. And so we've been doing that, and we did the revolving loan plan that helps pay for some of those neighborhood groceries that would come in and do, and do that. Smart streets, air pollution mm -hmm. control boards. Uh, every year we have uh, our environmental protection group that we have at the city of Huntsville. The city of Huntsville has their own natural resource department that, um, that, that, that puts out uh, some environmental uh, awards each year to each company. And you'll see these companies that will be on the same list time and time again. PPG is really big, Boeing is really big, Toyota is really big. And year after year, and we promote those companies because we want those kind of companies to, to, to succeed. We want other companies to follow their, their, uh, their lead. Uh, Huntsville Extreme Energy Makeover. $11 billion put into low-income houses in the city of Huntsville. You have to save 25% on, on your electric bill, which means your energy usage has gone down by 25%. Uh, you have to own your own home to be able to put on, put in new windows, to put in new uh, insulation, uh, to put on new roofs, to put insulation in those roofs. We've been able to put money in each one of those houses so that we can lower their power bill. And by lowering their power bill, make make their houses more sustainable, but also help to deal with just the general budget so that they can take the little amount of money that they make and they can still have money at the end of the month to buy food with. So uh, that's one of the things that we've been doing, I guess we started that two years ago and we've been doing it for the last two years. We'll probably have another year's worth of funding on it. New water treatment plant. 
Now, is energy efficient? The new water treatment plant is coming out of Gunnersville. So we're transporting water for a long way, but it's a, it's a more efficient use uh, way to uh, make sure that we treat our water. Our Google Fiber Gig City Initiative. Now, uh, it's kind of interesting. We put in the model of how we're going to do Google Fiber. Multiple utilities is coming in to put in the backbone. Google Fiber is leasing that backbone from multiple utilities, and it's not exclusive to, uh, to Google Fiber. Anybody else can come in who wants to start their own uh, their own fiber company, and they can they can also lease that dark fiber. But Google's paying six million dollars a year. Uh, it costs about sixty million dollars a year to put this in. Uh, six million dollars bonds out that sixty million dollars uh, for twenty years, and they're taking that last what they call the last mile from the from the right away in front of your house into your house. They're selling the content. They're selling the services, uh, and that's how they're going to make their money back. But it's a great business model for a mid tier type city. And what does that do for us in sustainability? For instance, it's great to have uh, internet. It makes you have smart houses. If you start having smart houses, then you, you know that you can cut down your uh, your utilities in the midst of the day when nobody's there. You can cut your utilities down where you're not using them as much and then have them come on about an hour before you come home so you walk into a house that is still cool. You can turn lights on and off. You can make sure that, uh, that your uh, water heat is cut off during the day, which is one of your highest uh, energy. That fiber to the home also gives us a backbone to do the smart systems that we're talking about, the smart systems of traffic control and having fiber at every traffic light that we can use. And then we can use them also with that fiber, we can connect them to our, uh, the, to our street lights out there. And then uh, during the middle of the night when nobody's there, the street lights go out. When they have sensors on them and people start coming up, lights start popping on and all of a sudden you're not burning lights when you don't need to. So the fiber to the home makes a big, big difference. Since we made our announcement that Google was going to provide fiber to the home, we've had four other uh, companies come in and say, we're going to provide fiber too, which is a great thing for our community because that competition will make sure that you get the best price you can on, on having fiber to your home. So we'll have, uh, as everybody's seen, if you've seen those guys with the little drillers and everything else, we have more fiber now than, uh, than we have ever had. And we were probably one of the most fiber cities uh, uh, 13,000 acres of preserved land. That's parks. In the city of Huntsville, we have over 100, and I think it's 125 different parks. Everything from uh, Goldsmith Shipland, which is a large natural park, to Hayes Preserve, which is a preserve, to even small pocket parks. We have 125 parks, 13,000 acres that's out there that is staying in sustainable land, that is green land that will stay sustainable for the city of Huntsville. Uh, ground, great field and ground field redevelopment. We have not been into that as much as some cities like Chattanooga. When you go up to Chattanooga, how I many have been to Chattanooga? Okay, you've been up there and you walk down that river walk and everything else, you see the big parks there. Those were ground fields. Those were former industries that were there. The industries polluted the land. They had to do something with the land, so they got a ground field, uh, they, they got a ground field grant from the U.S. government to come in and take them out, EPA paid for it. They took out the industry and they said, hey, while we're here, why don't we just make this into a big park? And they made it into a big park. And what a great way to reuse your property, to reuse your land. And, uh, my hat's off to them. They, they, had a, they had a lot of foresight and forethought on how that they took that ground field and made it into something natural and sustainable. Uh, shop local campaigns and farmers markets. One of the things that we've done uh, recently, especially with the farmers market, we're about to open Green Street Market. How I many have been down there and seen Green Street Market? I mean, uh, lots of different things. We have uh, farmers markets which are, still, are popping up around the city and they're mainly driven by churches. Churches do them as a service to the community and they, they end up selling not just the old produce that you do in the old days, you know, you sell produce and tomatoes and this. They might still have tomatoes, they might still have blueberries and things, but they also bring in jellies and jams and things that uh, people are making, that uh, breads and, and bakeries and things that uh, people are just making uh, naturally. And, and it's a great sustainability effort to do. And the great thing about it is government's got out of that business. We don't have to be in that business. We, we have left it. The free enterprise system has taken over. They found they're very popular and they've, they've taken off with them. So it's been a great way for us uh, to get out of a business. The government really shouldn't be in and sit there and watch, uh, watch these markets flourish. And they have flourished very well. So why does all this matter? 
all this matter, and it is, uh, it is as you kind of heard here, it's a broad, broad area. When you start talking about energy, Bill knows this from working with the energy council and, and seeing it. It's a huge area. It goes from LED lighting to uh, farm to table to food things to uh, traffic grids and, uh, and, and how to make your home more energy efficient. Huge area. Huge area of business. So when we first started doing Energy Hustle, we started to have a plan, but we also started because it's a place that we can have business. Chris has made his living off of that. He was a tennis pro before. He was about broke. But now he's, made it, he, he made it, he's making a great living off of solar panels and geothermal. But because there is a need out there, because it's sustainable, because it has a, it has a dollars and cents value to it, it, it has been an industry that has developed in our town and it's been a great industry for us. So, companies want to locate in sustainable uh, areas. Now, this is kind of interesting. When we go out and we go and um, we just kind of pull in Remington, we talk to Polaris about coming to Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, we talk to GEA Aviation about coming to Huntsville, Alabama. We get some of our smartest and best to talk to them. And they want to make sure that you have a certain thing. They want to make sure you have a museum. Although they may never go to the museum, they want to make sure you have a museum. They want to make sure that you have a symphony. They may never go to the symphony, but they want to make sure you have one. But one of the things that kind of step, um, lets us step out ahead of everybody else is our technology background. Part of that technology background is your sustainability. The kind of things that Amardex working on today, and the engineering director for the U.S. Army works on, those kind of things, those kind of functions, and those, those kind of things are what makes companies see you as a bright community, a high-tech community, and a community that understands how the world is put together and what the world does. Uh, sustainable communities are healthy and productive. We have a big problem in Alabama. We are always on the fattest list of everybody that you can have. And, um, and it's just amazing when you look down the list, we're always number 50. Fattest, the fattest states in the, in the world, sometimes it's 50. <laughs> but you start looking at it. a healthy community, a sustainable community is also a healthy community. And if, you're, if your workers are healthy, we work uh, quite a bit. We uh, start with Alabama Scale Back, then we start with the Healthy Huntsville Initiative, we start with some other, uh, we, we do some other things for a healthy population. Why do you want your workers to be healthy? I want my workers in the city of Huntsville to be healthy because they're more productive than they're healthy. They're outlets, they work hard, they can do more. Uh, they also have a better home life because if you're healthy, you can you can participate in things and you can do things at home. But you want a healthy uh, population, and a healthy population means that you, as a sustainable group, means that uh, means that you're more productive, that you can do more. Sustainable communities are less vulnerable to the failures of infrastructure. Now, we are until we have that big EMP blast. The big EMP blast comes and go back to Stone Age. But one of the things you look at when you look across the, across the board, we, as a, as a um, sustainable community, we try to do more with less. If we do more with less, we are a healthier community. And we, we do have less failures of our infrastructure. We put less money in overhead, more money in community. That's my key. If I put less dollars into uh, into having uh, into my gasoline bill, which uh, which my trucks use for the city of Huntsville, and they use less gas, uh, then I have more money than I can put somewhere else. I can put into a park, I can put into a quality of life, or I can put into uh, something that affects the citizens. The less money that I spend on energy, the more money I can put somewhere else. At home, the less money you put into your paying your uh, power bill, the more money you can put somewhere else into a quality of life. And we want to make sure that Huntsville remains being known as a clean city. Now, clean city is a couple of things. Clean city is, number one, we don't want to be on the EPA bad list. Because they have dropped those EPA numbers year by year by year. We've been able to be a sustainable city. There, there, pretty soon there are not going to be many sustainable cities left because they keep dropping the EPA numbers. And if you're not a sustainable city, then every time you do a road project, you have got to go through EPA and get EPA 
EPA's uh, permission to go through that. There's one more step that you have to go through. You're not a sustainable city every time you site a landfill, you have to do something else. If you're not a sustainable city, every time you put in a new power grid or something that's going to use more power, you have to do something. You have to go through some hoops. Uh, being a sustainable city, it makes sure that your energy costs stay low, that your cost of construction stays low. Also, it makes sure that you can continue to construct because there are some places where they have not let you do that. So that, that, is, that is important to you. A clean city, also, the clean environment. If you've ever seen what green, green thing does, we go out and we pick up trash. We pick up trash everywhere. But we do it so that we can have a clean city because people come in here and one comment, one of the comments that I always have is, wow, how do you keep it so clean? We have a green team that goes out and does that on a day-to-day -day basis. We want to keep a sustainable, clean city. We want the reputation to do that. That's what we've done with the city of Huntsville. That's how we've been able to make the city of Huntsville vote like that. Um, I hope I've kind of given you an idea about where we are and what we do. Very large, very encompassing. But when you put it all together, this makes for a better city. It makes for a better community. recycling in your restaurants or in your grocery stores or in wherever people are working or where they can you know take their cardboard and recycle it. Uh, mandating we have not gotten to that stage. We felt better about trying to get the technology where we can actually when the garbage comes in and put it put on the floor we can actually uh, you know, separate it there and separate it out because if we can get that technology working then we'll have a huge source of uh, of cardboard, paper, or plastics that we can actually sell and help offset the costs of doing it. Uh, if, we, if we do make them uh, do it, they'll end up selling it off and they'll sell it off piecemeal. They'll still have to pay a little bit for somebody to come get it, but we'll never get the quantity that we need to be able to bring in. We had somebody come in and this, this is an idea, just think about this. Somebody came in the other day and said, we'll take all the plastics that you can provide in Madison County, we'll sort it on the floor. And you know what they were going to do with it? They were going to make railroad ties. Now, you think about that. Railroad ties are made of wood. After so many years, they have to dig them out. They have to put them back in. And now, if you have railroad ties that are made of recycled plastics, they, they, never, they never deteriorate. They don't have to take them out and put them back in. It makes a whole lot of sense to do that. 
And, um, and, and this is one of the projects that we're still working on right now. That falls into the same line of like, you know, our bus system. I mean, our bus system is a modern bus system, very modern, minimal bus system, which we would love to have as a bigger bus system. But everybody, how many of y'all have a car here? How many of y'all have a bus here? Or how many of you drove a bus here? Everybody wants their car. Because they want the car close. They want to be able to do it. And they, they, at this point, we have not educated enough, and people have not, um, it's not cost efficient enough to ride the bus. I need to ride the bus because I don't really need to have a car payment. And I don't need to have a, uh, a, a, a insurance payment. And I don't need to pay for uh, gas. We haven't gotten to that stage yet. And one of the things that we've done is, is I call it the transportation ecosystem. And if we brought in Uber, we brought in Lyft, all of a sudden you can come to, and you brought in the new bike system that you can rent a bike out, out in front of, you know, if you're downtown. All of a sudden you've made it where the, where you're going from work to uh, from work to home, and then where you're going to get your food stuff, and where you're going to have the work play experiences and everything else, they're all close enough that you can afford maybe not to have a car. And that's the first time we've been able to do that is we built urban developments in the downtown area with the avenue with Twickenham. Uh, many days, Harrison lives over in Twickenham. He'll walk to work. He'll walk back home. He'll walk to Publix, which is right next to his uh, development there. If he wants to go somewhere, he'll call Uber, or he has a lift car that he can pick up, or uh, you know, a zip car that he can pick up, or he can, now we can call Lyft. Our transportation ecosystem is getting to the stage where it makes it easy. And unfortunately, we don't want it unless it's easy. And that's just, that's just human nature. So now we're getting the ecosystem down to where it's getting easier and we're getting the pieces put in place so that people can actually do what you're talking about, find an easier way to do this. Well, that is for, uh, I don't know if it works, but for kids, mm -hmm. the kids
One quick comment, question for the room basically, is that, so this is a campus that's very technologically advanced, with a lot of smart people, very smart city. How do you take that knowledge base and insert it into programs you can use it? Like how can somebody in this room go, hey, I got an idea of how to make the yeah. house less efficient or more efficient? Listen, the way we've been able to do it, and this has been, been really interesting as we move through, is technology transfers or something we have been pushing in this community. Uh, that's why we put together the Green 13, which made the Green 25, which became uh, the Green 40. It, it was everybody who was interested in how to have a sustainable program in, in town, whether they were interested in uh, farm, you know, farm to table, or whether they were interested in how to do an SMR, a small nuclear reactor, or how to, whether they were interested in, uh, in, in natural gas or, or the conservation of energy on a home. They all came in and were part of the plan that we put together. Uh, from that plan, we have turned we have turned from that plan to doing focus groups. We have focus groups on industry and part of the industry talk is technology transfers. How do we take the technology transfers that are out there? Transform it into what we do in day-to-day -day lives. And that's that's for us, that's one of the biggest things. We have what nine different focus groups right now. They're usually uh, 15 to 20 people, they're some of the best and the brightest in the industry. And we're trying to take That's, that's portions of what we do. Um, maybe it's time for, for us to revisit the Green 13 idea, see where we are, see what we achieved out of the uh, first report, and see how we need to bring to do another report, and also see how technology has stepped in to be a new part of it. And, um, your group uh, is, is one of the smartest and brightest groups that we have in town, especially as an engineering director. That's, uh, we need to tie it together. Thank y'all so much.